without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Shania Harris, who is um, um, the Larry D. and Brenda A. Thompson Curator of African American and African uh, Diasporic Art here at the Georgia Museum of Art. Well, thanks, Callan, for that great introduction and housekeeping uh, information. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody for coming uh, online with us and uh, viewing this presentation, this discussion on Emma Amos' Color Odyssey uh, exhibition at the Georgia Museum of Art that opened on January 30th and will uh, continue to be on view until April the 25th, 2021. The exhibition will travel uh, to the Munson Williams Proctor Arts Institute in Utica, New York uh, following our presentation uh, in June and it'll open in June. And we will have a final presentation of this exhibition at the Philadelphia Museum of Art uh, in, that opens in October. So we'll, you know, knowing COVID, we have to keep, we, we, we hate to give dates and then have to change them. But at this point in history, it looks like we'll, those dates will be, uh, will, will be pretty accurate. And you can keep up with that through our website and through the websites of those institutions in the coming months. So I'd like to um, first start by mentioning uh, some of our panelists for today um, who will be discussing Emma's work and her legacy uh, at, at not only in um, to the state of Georgia for which she was originally born and was a native, but also uh, nationally, internationally. Um, she participated in, uh, in so many different um, areas of the art world. And some of our panelists here today will be able to discuss different aspects and how it's uh, impacted um, our study um, of American art, feminist art, and African-American artists. The first individual I'd like to um, acknowledge for being a part of this program is one of our own here at the University of Georgia, uh, Professor Diane Edison, who is an esteemed professor of art here at the Lamar Dodd School of Art and where she served on the faculty since 1992. Uh, Dr. Ed, I mean, Professor Edison um, has had an enduring interest in portraiture and that was one of the uh, reasons why I wanted her to um, be on this panel today uh, because of her work as a portrait artist, um, auto, autobiographical uh, portraits as or self portraits as well as portraits of others that have a very, uh, deeply psychological and emotional uh, sensibility to them. And so she's a great artist in her own right. She's represented by George Adams Gallery, uh, which is ironically uh, a hair's, uh, you know, hair's breadth away from the gallery that represents uh, Emma Amos's work, uh, Ryan Lee Gallery uh, in Chelsea. And so I find it kind of interesting. We'll talk a little bit further on about uh, that, that New York art scene and, um, in, based on um, Professor Edison's experience with it, as well as an artist. Uh, the other panelist um, who will be a part of our discussion is Professor Phoebe Wolfskill, who's an associate professor in the departments of African American and African Diaspora Studies at Indiana University. Uh, she's an accomplished writer and scholar in her own right, uh, producing a monograph on Archibald Motley Jr several articles and major uh, periodicals, including the American Art Journal, which she did wonderful research on Emma Amos herself. And uh, her current research focuses on the black participation in the history of photography um, as both sitters and, um, and photographers themselves. And uh, so she'll be talking with us a little bit more when we discuss uh, Amos's use of photography. And finally, uh, Laurel Garber, who is the Park family, a Park family assistant curator of prints and drawings at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, which will be our final venue for the exhibition uh, once it leaves uh, Georgia. And her research specializes in uh, relationships between master printers and printmakers. And we'll uh, talk a lot about uh, Emma and Mrs. Printmaking ability and uh, the great collaborations that she had with um, master printers and other printmakers um, in, over the years. So let's go to the first slide. So 
In many ways for me, uh, this is uh, something that has come full circle in terms of uh, doing this exhibition. I met Emma Amos approximately, well, I think it's, it's been about a decade, over a decade ago, uh, as an artist who had matured and had established herself as a professor at Rutgers University at the Mason School, Mason Grove School of Art. And uh, I, I kind of got to her at the time when she, she was a, first, a few years out of retirement and she was actively working in her studio as she always had uh, as a, an, excuse me, as an uh, active artist in New York. And I just had no idea what type of odyssey I was going to encounter uh, in working with her um, and getting to know her uh, both uh, personally, um, but also in uh, a scholarly sense. And so this project kind of rounds out um, not only my uh, relationship with her um, and her uh, unfortunate passing um, in 2020, but also kind of my interest in her work. Uh, and study of her work over time. And so, you know, for, for those of you who are not aware, um, Amos passed away um, on May 20th, uh, 2020. So as we were planning the exhibition, you know, we knew that her health had uh, declined uh, due to Alzheimer's, but we, we, we were hoping that at least she would uh, be able to live to see the exhibition or at least hear about it um, and the publication that also accompanies it because it was the subject of many of our discussions in uh, earlier years before her health declined. So it's kind of bittersweet, uh, but I think that in many ways she would be proud to know that her work was being shown in her home state of Georgia for which she often uh, talked quite a bit about uh, in our conversations, um, as well as uh, it's, uh, its expansion to other uh, other venues for people to have a new uh, appreciation for her work. And so I'll just can advance to the next slide. So I mentioned this, um, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, you can stay at the first side, Callan, I'm sorry. <laughs> this whole notion of Georgia roots, and this is um, just a little uh, collage of um, images of family. And I'd like to say a special thanks to Emma Amos's family, particularly her, her son and daughter, uh, Nick and India Amos, as well as the Ryan Lee Gallery, which represents her work, for sharing so many wonderful photographs of uh, the Amos family. I'd also like to acknowledge um, the Auburn uh, Avenue Research Center in Atlanta that has an archive of Amos's family uh, papers as well as um, many photographs that the artist actually herself, um, along probably with her brother, uh, donated to the research center I think back in the 90s or so. Um, the Amos family, uh, coincidentally, is, is a very notable family in the city of Atlanta for which Amos was always proud to be a part of uh, that history of Atlanta and um, having those roots in Atlanta as a metropolis uh, that housed a lot, of, uh, a lot of scholars, a lot of doctors, lawyers, you name it, uh, advanced um, individuals who advanced in certain fields, uh, including her own father uh, and her grandfather who were among the, uh, the very few African-Americans who owned their own pharmacy with her grandfather, Moses, being the first licensed African-American uh, pharmacist in the state. So that was a proud part of her history. This first image shows the Amos Drugstore, um, which was uh, a staple in uh, the Black Atlanta community in the early 20th century. And so Amos made it the subject um, of several works in her latter part of her career, but she often referenced the histories of uh, those who were in the community of Atlanta when she was growing up, the stories of all of the notable historical figures that passed through, for example, the pharmacy and knew her parents, uh, and it became a part of her history. And I think it kind of underscores uh, for, for, for me a lot of the emphasis that Amos has on looking back 
historically as she began to kind of think about how she wanted to construct her work over time. Um, that it wasn't just about her own lived experiences, but about her reaching back and making connections to historical moments that she felt that she was connected to. So that's like a recurring theme uh, for Amos. And uh, I, I think that uh, Phoebe, um, in talking about photography and Amos's use of photography, not only to inspire her work, but also in her work, I don't know if you have some thoughts about, uh, you know, how history and photography uh, kind of play into her work at, overall over time. Yeah, I think she's really interesting in this regard because she has a lot of family photographs, like the one you're showing here of Amos Drugstore, um, and and part of the the works I talk about uh, in my essay are ones that um, she inherited. Uh, from George Chivery, who was um, a friend of the family, was her godmother's um, husband. And so she inherited a bunch of images of his trips through the South um, of African-American populations in the 1930s, so Depression era. So she uses those and those are anonymous subjects that she seeks to reframe so that we think about them in a different way, perhaps not just in terms of Depression era, South, but also sort of the larger systems that encompass them by using flags. And in this particular work, the idea that, you know, the South is not just about, this history of the South is sort of stereotypically um, sort of black rural poor, right? She pushes against that consistently because that's not her experience at all. First of all, it's urban, it's Atlanta, um, but her family was quite elite. They were friends with Du Bois, Zora Neale Hurston hung out with them, um, you know, all of that. So she wants to take Shivery's photographs and do something with those and say, hey, this is a you know reality during the Depression era. Um, but she also uses so many of her own photographs as well and then reframes them. And part of what I find interesting about her use of photography is she doesn't just take the photograph itself, but she creates a laser print. And so there's a kind of distancing effect. It's very grainy, it's very gritty. And so you can never see the whole thing. You're sort of struggling to make sense of it to some degree. So that, I think it's a nice reflection on how memory works that to some extent, you know, what you're seeing it almost through her eyes. What do I remember about this beloved family member, um, you know, her, her, her grandmother, her mother, and then herself there, um, or this drugstore, which, I mean, she would have memories as, as a child, but that there's that, um, a kind of veil over it that, that pre presents some kind of distance there. So I see her doing that pretty consistently with how she appropriates ph photography, how she uses it in her work. It's just not the image itself. It's, it's sort of, there's, she's, she's done something to it to create, not a complete narrative, but, you know, sort of pushes us to ask questions about what this is about, what it means to her. Well, I, I like these, I mean, I started with these um, ladder works uh, that she created uh, in 2015, also to kind of make another analogy. And that is that not only is she use herself, um, her family or those that she, I consider them to be adopted family in terms of her use of photography where she kind of invents family or invents connections with individuals, as you mentioned, that could have been anonymous or unknown to her, but that there's this kind of inventive quality uh, that, that comes through through photo her use of photography. Um, and then in this particular image, it's, it's, it's quite telling because there's this kind of genealogical, uh, reference that she's kind of making with the three images of her, her grandmother, her mother, and herself. And there's this sense with Amos about being a part of a larger genealogy, uh, not just in her own family, but the family of artists that we'll see in a lot of her works and her departing from it, but at the same time appreciating it. So she loves history she loves the sense of being connected to a larger history, but she also likes to play with it. Mm -hmm. She also likes to crop it and cut it and, you know, and frame it the way she wants to frame it and apply, you know, different types of materials like that are maybe considered not unconventional or maybe not even considered to be high art of into her work. Um, and that's kind of a consistent theme that we'll see throughout 
uh, in the exhibition and, and in her work. Yeah, everything is fragments, absolutely. And this is a quick image, uh, I'm sorry to cut across you, yeah. of um, speaking of um, Amos's connection to Atlanta, it was an enduring one, uh, of course, with having family roots there. This is uh, just a quick image of her uh, draped across uh, the mosaic bench that she designed for Ralph Abernathy uh, Park uh, in Atlanta in 1996. And I, I visited that site uh, Oh, about a few years ago. And I remember, you know, kind of walking through and it was very quiet, of course, and there was a park nearby and kind of thinking about, you know, how Amos is, you know, applying everything that, you know, she, she, she knows from the sense of creating this kind of visual tapestry of textiles, images, and you name it, even in uh, a mosaic form. So I think that this is that's kind of the undercurrent for a lot of what uh, she does, and Atlanta is the center of that. So we'll go to the next one. And just a kind of another connection to Atlanta for those who may not realize that she designed uh, a poster. This is not the post actual poster, but there was a design that was very similar to this. Um, this calligraph and uh, or mixed media print that she created based on that design. And so this also this idea of, ins again, inserting herself, uh, seeing herself as kind of succeeding, if you will, in this rarefied art world and, and reconnecting it with those roots in Atlanta was something that interested in me uh, when I first started working um, at the Georgia Museum of Art. And was one of the reasons why uh, I wanted to construct an exhibition um, on the artist is that, you know, we honored her in 2016 um, at our annual African-American history uh, celebration. And all I could remember <laughs> um, from Amos uh, in reading like articles from her years earlier, she did one for the new, that was printed in the New York Times I think in the mid nineties. And she mentioned that, well, they only remember me during black history month. That's the only time I'm shown like a lot of other African-American artists. And the irony is that we celebrated her during black history month, but I'm like, but I don't want it to be a black history month exhibition. This is about celebrating the artistry and black history month might be you know, connected to it, obviously, we're in Black History Month right now. Uh, but, you know, being able to kind of break beyond uh, those strictures of just simply observing, uh, you know, her artistry in that kind of limited sequence, uh, I thought that that was really important. And, and you know, I always see it kind of coming through in her work, how she's always bursting beyond the scenes, if you will, or out of the frame uh, to, to have her work uh, be recognized for the complexity that is inherent in it. So I'll go to the next slide. And so how does it all begin? And so she of course was educated in the, uh, the Atlanta public school system. She attended Booker T. Washington um, High School uh, she actually did some early art training at the Morris Brown uh, College uh, before she even entered high school. She participated in the famed Atlanta art annuals that were organized by uh, the great artist Hale Woodruff, uh, who she re-encountered later. And so again, Atlanta had a great formative experience for Amos, but the big uh, moment for her to kind of professionally uh, move into becoming an artist was when she attended Antioch College in, uh, in Ohio, in Yellow Springs, Ohio, but also when she, uh, she traveled and studied in London through the program uh, that uh, was a part of her study at Antioch where uh, students were able to study abroad. Uh, so like many students, she studied abroad in her final year and she studied etching uh, for a year as well, and received a certificate at the Central School of Art. So what does all this have to do with anything? Oh, 
oh, if you could go back one more slide to that first slide, sure. Um, so I'm interested in you know, this early period because most of what we know about Amos is her work with textiles and figuration. And when she was, when she first started out, she was inspired by abstract expressionist painters and felt that that was what she wanted to be. In an interview that was uh, done in 1968, she, when she first saw abstraction, it was in London and she wanted to become an abstractionist. And this early painting from the late 1950s shows just kind of how the kind of the fever for abstract expressionism hit uh, Amos as a young artist. And, you know, I'm not really, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not really sure how many paintings she did while she was in London, but we know that she did do a body of work uh, that was uh, leaning toward abstraction and these kind of geographic, I mean, these kind of topo topological uh, paintings. Oh, next slide, please. But her, her great love was for uh, etching and it began also in London and it continued um, in the first part of her career. And I, I'm, I'm just kind of um, trying to query, you know, how many, uh, you know, like how many artists uh, in the or, or artists from her era were as as interested in studying, let's say, you know, etching in um, in London or like what the scene might have been like uh, to do uh, for printmaking in America, in London. And I don't know if Laurel, if you wanted to talk a little bit about like the the scene for printmaking in the 1950s, if there's if there's any kind of yeah, I mean, I think she really finds herself in a scene in London, especially artists who are thinking with color or, or color supports, as we see here. Um, I think she really brings her abstraction into this print practice. And what I really like about this etching that you're showing here is the way that she's already really um, finding texture in printmaking, which will become, you know, so important to all the prints she makes, especially in the 70s, 80s and later. Um, but you see her really finding finding a way to achieve um, such a variety of texture and even tone and color through black ink alone. So she she finds in London um, a scene that's experimental, sort of trying to carry in abstraction and modern art aesthetics into traditional media, like like etching. Um, and she, when she arrives finally in New York, really joins these um, print hubs that are really dedicated to an innovative experimental um, approach to a centuries old medium. So she, she works with haters, um, a sort of extension of the famous Atelier 17 print workshop. Um, at Letario Calipi, and then begins a um, sort of long-standing relationship with the Blackburn, Blackburn workshop, um, you know, known for the way it um, served as an important sort of community and space for the sharing of technical know-how relating to prints, but also relationships between very skilled printers and artists wanting to push their practice into, into printmaking. Um, and there she meets a printer that we could talk about a little bit later, Kathy Caraccio, with whom she prints for many decades. And they work together to really push, push printmaking in, in ways that Amos feels is responsive to the way that her own larger practice is developing. So I think it's incredible that you can, in Amos's career alone, sort of track these really important centers for experimental printmaking, both in London and then definitely in New York too. Yeah, and I, and I also started thinking about how many women were, you know, kind of participating, um, you know, in this kind of, you know, a, a eruption of printmaking. I mean, oftentimes we don't hear about the women, um, you know, I mean, as we, you know, come to find out with many areas of, uh, or many media. Uh, so, 
you know, this is all, this particular print also fasc fascinates me because at the time that Amos um, creates this, you know, she's also encountering the idea of moving back to the States. So she's, she moves back to Atlanta briefly and really just stays about a year. And her first exhibition or solo exhibition, not her first exhibition, but her first solo exhibition was an exhibition, not in New York, but in Atlanta, where she had a show of her prints or her etchings. And I want to think, I don't have proof yet, but I want to think that this, uh, this particular etching or at least a series connected to it might have been exhibited in that very first uh, exhibition in Atlanta, which for which she was very proud uh, that, and, and, and it also showed um, Atlanta to be uh, kind of evolving, if you will, in its contemporary art scene of that time, uh, not only in terms of showing Amos or these, uh, these abstract works, but also showing a black woman artist uh, at a time when you know, Atlanta was still highly segregated. Um, and for some, for the new arts gallery under uh, the Judith Alexander, who was a, a young uh, dealer um, at the time to exhibit Amos's work, that was pretty outstanding. And I'm sure she was proud uh, of that. So I'll go to the next slide. Uh oh, we somehow jumped ahead. Let's see. Oh. Somehow that moved out of place. We'll go back to that. <laughs> so, um, so talking about New York and uh, Amos's migration to New York, uh, that of course would have a major um, impact on her, both artistically as well as socially. Uh, she met her husband in New York. Um, she developed a career in New York that lasted over 60 years. Uh, you know, New York was is the center of the art world then um, for Amos and uh, as it is still for many artists. But, um, you know, it was kind of slow, slow going in terms of her developing kind of a relationship with galleries and doing exhibitions. So like many people, she was able to use her skills and her talents uh, in design in other fields. And one of the things that's being re-examined now is her relationship with uh, the noted uh, designer, uh, Dorothy Leaves, who, uh, whose studio did a lot of great work um, in design uh, for interiors, uh, for domestically, as well as for businesses, We're working with uh, Bigelow Sanford uh, Corporation. Um, Amos was a weaver and it's uh, according to Amos, the reason why uh, Le Liebs uh, hired her wasn't necessarily because of her brief experience uh, learning textile weaving and uh, textile uh, textile weaving at the at Antioch or at or in London, but because of her her etchings and the designs, and she thought that those designs were beautiful and very inventive. And so there's this, again, there's still this tie in between uh, uh, Amos's, uh, you know, various, uh, the various media that she practiced in to, for people to see her eye for design. And so I just have some images of Amos's time with Leaves, uh, which lasted over a decade or so. So she comes to New York in 1960, I think in 1961, uh, she starts working with Leaves. She was also teaching. Uh, at a private school called the Dalton School, briefly, and so she was doing a lot of a lot of jobs. But she was also still, as Laurel mentioned earlier, still etching, still um, working in the printmaking medium. But I think that again, this is uh, this kind of underscores this eclectic manner in which she would always have to work, uh, and that she became very very comfortable in working, and. I'm not really, uh, and I'm not really, of course, aware other than historically what the, it was, it was before I was born, <laughs> um, what the scene was like in New York in the 1960s um, in terms of artists like uh, Amos who might have probably migrated there. And I, I don't know if Diane, if you wanted to talk a little bit about 
uh, what the scene was like in um, in the in the 1960s. I'm sure quite explosive, <laughs> uh, quite interesting. I would be able to speak more to the 1990s because I was just 10 in 1960. I thought you said that you were <laughs> that you were not knowledgeable about Amos in an earlier period. I was not. I was knowledgeable about her as an artist and as someone who was very generous in spirit. There was a group in New York in the '90s called the Fantastic Coalition for Women in the Arts, and she was one of the founding members. And it was a situation where young artists could join and learn about art, learn about arts and letters. Sit, literally sitting at the feet of the masters. And I was a junior member at that time. And I learned so much and she was so generous. I think as a group, we were able to even curate a show. So I knew her in 1990 as that artist. And I was aware of her in 1970 as I was a student in New York. Well, now that I've aged you and I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> um, that I misunderstood our one of our discussions, uh, but that does actually tie into something that uh, if Callan could go back to the previous slide, um, that uh, that I wanted to kind of underscore too. Oh, Callan, if oh sure, uh, and that is this whole idea of artist support groups and you know how artists are able to navigate uh, the the scenes of uh, in their local settings, but particularly a big scene like the New York art scene and particularly for um, an emerging artist like Amos, uh, who was also a woman and uh, African descent. And this is just showing an image of uh, a work by Amos called Without Feather Boa that was produced in the mid sixties while she was a part of the group Spiral. And Spiral, you know, has, uh, a long, I mean, had a short history, but uh, a tremendous amount of influence um, in terms of our study of um, artists of that period and how artists were reckoning with their place in the art world, particularly in places like New York, uh, where she was uh, active. Amos knew, uh, knew, Hale, knew of the, one of the founders of Spiral, Hale Woodruff, uh, from childhood, from his days teaching in Atlanta. But uh, she never really quite got to know him more deeply until she got to New York. And so New York becomes this kind of nexus um, for, for her, not only in terms of meeting new people, but also uh, establishing connections uh, with great artists um, like Woodruff and influential ones. Um, like Woodruff and Romer Bearden, Norman Lewis. And so I think that it also began to shift her thinking um, away from those early experiments in London um, and to also think about the social implications of her work, uh, being black, being a woman uh, in, in, in the kind of explosive period of the 1960s with the civil rights movement uh, the women's liberation movements and other countercultural movements. And again, this autobiographical element and this kind of notion of uh, self-portraiture kind of begins to emerge uh, during this period. So she, so we see a work like Without Feather Boa where Amos uses herself as a model, uh, which she does with many of her works uh, throughout her career. And you get to see how she kind of integrates uh, the herself into her various media. Uh, Amos, by the way, only spent, I would say about maybe two or three years with Spiral. It ended practically in 1966 or so. Um, it's not quite definitive because there was no official, official end date, but it kind of fizzled. Uh, but it always had a tremendous influence on how she thought about herself uh, as an artist. Here's one painting that uh, was done with the, what has historically been considered the single uh, group exhibition of the Spiral Group. And it's an untitled landscape uh, or somewhat of a landscape, abstract landscape uh, that was done for that 19, that famed 1965 um, exhibition. And I think that uh, one of the things that it also shows is Amos grappling with 
uh, this notion of how race, uh, how she can kind of represent the 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 kind of tensions that the the group was was attempting to us to uh, to navigate, and that is the place of the black artist uh, in America, uh, and you know what their special role was and how their work should should be uh, represented. And Amos grappled with this idea that there was a black art. You know, she felt that you know, as an artist, her experience, whatever it was, was going to show up in her work, and that there was no one definitive uh, form of Black art. Uh, and, and so a painting like this, you know, she kind of inserts abstraction um, into uh, the vocabulary of uh, that exhibition, um, with only a slight reference to humanity. And uh, if anyone can notice in the, in the middle, there's this, what looks like a hand that's kind of embedded in the center or is kind of abstractly drawn or kind of vaguely drawn. But she, but it does again, shift her thinking after being with Spiral about how she wants to represent herself as an artist and how she wants her work to be seen. Um, so next slide, please. And so here are some other uh, works that were produced uh, in that period. Uh, she begins to also experiment with a lot of color. Uh, and and I, I would say a lot of color in the sense of its brilliance, but usually, you know, different tones of red or green and yellow and blue kind of primary, uh, primary usage of uh, certain colors. But this kind of explosiveness with color she ironically felt was linked more to printmaking than painting. And I just kind of compared these two, um, these two works. And, uh, you know, and I'm not really, I'm not always aware of, you know, some of the nuances uh, when it comes to the, the printmaking uh, medium that she uses uh, here. But I don't know if Laurel, if you could talk a little bit about kind of the chromatic uh, yeah. element in some works like these relative to painting? Well, it's striking to me, be, I mean, I am more familiar with her etching and aquatint prints that come come a little bit later. Um, I mean, Without Feather Boa is a color etching too. So for me, this is a sort of striking print in her, in her body of work for the brightness of its colors. I mean, we'll see in examples uh, a little bit later that she certainly finds amazing rich tones and colors um, in her printmaking practice, but um, usually not in such a saturation as we see here. And that's exactly what what silk oh what, what silk screen can really do. So I believe she's probably making this at Blackburn's studio and workshop, um, possibly working with a master printer. And in that in that technique, silk screen, you can get these bold. Um, Sort of uniform, almost flat uh, um, passages of color that we we see on the print at left, and I think this pairing is great. I mean, you can see her working out the same kind of view out her window in in print and in painting, um, and sort of using the media to um, manipulate color differently. And I think the kind of flat boldness of the silk screen is really what that medium can can do. And she's playing with it here. So I guess for the next few images, because to, to advance along, we'll just show some of her um, works that are in the exhibition. Uh, and you can kind of see a trend if you go through the next two or three uh, where she's inserting herself or self portraits of herself or other people that uh, may have been around her. And, you know, there's this, again, this rich color, but also color has other overtones with Amos. Uh, you know, social overtones with her. Uh, she uses color to kind of, you know, visually to create separation, but it also has, again, a social impact um, or, or kind of emotional impact there. Um, and, you know, Amos was also infamous for not only uh, inserting herself as in terms of self-portraits or others that were, you know, accessible to her, 
but also changing their skin tone and, you know, kind of playing with this whole idea of mixing and mixing color, but also mi mixing it from a social standpoint, uh, based in part on her own uh, rec reckoning with her own mixed uh, background uh, in terms of her Native American ancestry, uh, her, um, her, even her own husband uh, was uh, a white Jewish man um, and her children you know, were often mistaken for being white. And she would often remark about how she didn't want people to think that her kids were just white kids, uh, that she wanted people to realize that they were complex uh, and she was as well. And so this whole idea of using color to kind of make these social and political statements about uh, how we relate to one another uh, in society uh, and often the confusion that arises um, is inherent in um, all her work as well. So it, so it sometimes forms like a kind of subtext uh, that you know often doesn't come up in discussion, um, but it's there. You know, there's this is a very important work, uh, Sandy and her husband, where she has the image of a domestic interior that uh, shows her her friend. Uh, Sandy and obviously her husband. And in the background, there's a painting that is actually a real painting done by Amos uh, called The Flower Sniffer that she pictures herself uh, in. And I love the way that she's kind of in, I call it this, um, she's kind of in this little ovoid shape where it's almost like she's in the, the kind of like a little fetus that's developing as an artist in that in that kind of circular format and you have the tan and the yellow and the white. And I always want to think that there is a, a social subtext about skin color, you know, that a person with yellow skin or with, you know, brown paper bag skin or white skin and how she's kind of playing with that even in a work like The Flower Sniffer, but also talking about this, this idea of complexifying this, uh, this social environment. So the big part for um, a, a, a large uh, a large piece of Amos's work, of course, involves textiles, uh, but not just textiles for mere decoration, but textiles to, are, are used to also do something uh, in her composition. And one of the big things that it does is it helps to move her figures. So in those early paintings that we just uh, went through, Amos had relatively static figures, portraits or semi-abstract portraits of uh, bathers at the beach, uh, including herself, very colorful. Uh, then she moves into uh, utilizing textiles as a kind of primary uh, mode of representing the human figure. And uh, we're, we're of course aware of her uh, time with Dorothy Leaves uh, as a weaver. So she was very familiar with using textiles in her work, but also she was a co-host of a, of a craft show. And she always felt like she had to kind of suppress that urge to employ uh, uh, in the early part of her career, um, you know, that kind of craft element uh, that's often associated with textiles. But she very, uh, very skillfully begins to reincorporate it in the 80s in these very fantastic and dynamic um, images of athletes uh, that she saw in you know, competitions for the Olympics or in sports competitions regularly on television. And I mean, they're fantastic because they also use, utilize her own weavings as the primary uh, the primary material with some painting applied. So it's kind of the uh, reverse of what most people would expect, that you'd expect that it would just be a painting with some textile fragments applied. For Amos, it was often the textile was the primary uh, mode of operating and then painting was applied uh, later on. And I think it's also interesting because she viewed the canvas as a part of the material uh, and the negative space uh, to be just as much a part of the imagery as the, uh, the kind of the positive 
uh, figures. Amos also transcended the whole issue of whether it's fine art or crafts. It right. was in craft was fine art to her, and she was able to combine both of them in a, a really amazing way. Because that yeah. whole debate started in the 70s, whether or not you can consider the crafts as fine arts, and it's still going on today. Yeah, yeah, and I think that, you know, individuals are beginning to kind of rediscover how uh, artists like Amos, particularly other feminist artists, were you know, employing this kind of notion of, of using textiles or using forms that were associated with craft or so-called women's work um, mm -hmm. into, their, um, into their art. And Amos had another, uh, another thing in her arsenal, and that is that she began to kind of diversify the kinds of textiles that she began to use. Um, not only her own weavings, but also the use of kind of international uh, textiles, particularly African or uh, ones that are kind of considered to be African textiles. And I think she liked playing with the idea of, again, this high and low uh, in when it comes to use, utilizing uh, cloth or fabric in her work, but also this whole notion of what is foreign and what is um, what is domestic, you know, what is African, what is non-African. Uh, and that also ties in with a lot of the narratives that kind of uh, get formulated uh, in her works. This work here uh, the, is called The Raft and it's a part of the water series that Amos uh, has in the 1980s. And the uh, water series emphasizes of course, divers and swimmers. And here she begins to engage more with uh, a more expressionistic painting style and kind of uh, using the, the fabric as board, more or less as borders uh, and also with some additions uh, in probably a, a lesser manner than she had in those earlier uh, works that uh, we just showed. Uh, next slide. And so movement becomes a metaphor uh, not only for the uh, the expressiveness of the human body, but also uh, the again the social uh, you know kind of social messages that can be uh, inferred from them. This is tumbling after uh, from 1986, and this is a work where she begins to kind of transition into another series called the Falling series. And I don't know, Phoebe, um, you know, I I know that you've you, we've taken you and I probably are most familiar with the um, with the falling series uh, in our training uh, at in art history uh, because I think this was like the uh, the first thing I learned about Emma Amos was about the falling series. That's all I would ever hear about was the falling series, even more so than her her um, her connection to spiral um, is was always about these kind of moving bodies that were falling uh, and. I don't know if you wanted to talk a little bit about like what the significance of falling might. Uh... Yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting because you know you showed us those works earlier of abstract expressionism, and it's sort of the movement of that earlier work that is prominent in the brushstrokes. The movement of abstract expressionism by the '80s becomes these figures in movement. And so it's bodies themselves that are falling. Um, and I know that you know in conversation with Bell Hooks they they spoke about how this is so sort of destabilizing and perhaps scary to have these falling bodies like what is, you know what does this mean is this a, a dreamlike scenario is this a nightmare but that also that that movement is inherently important because it means you're finding a new place for yourself as you fall um so it means sort of new beginnings as well which i think so much of her work deals with again the, the idea of having um uh a sort of unfinished narrative that it that it, it keeps moving. Um, so so a lot of it, you know, it's got the the sort of energy of that th those abstract brushstrokes that appear really in all of her work. Um, but then it's also got that figuration, the attention to color, and then the the sort of constantly moving body without a definitive space. So you're they're always sort of you know trying to find their space. But you know, looking at this too, it seems to connect to the athlete series that you showed as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I guess we can advance to the next one. And here's another, just a few to go through uh, since we're 
we're advancing in time. I can stay on top of this all day. Um, here's a detail of Flying Circus yeah, and Targets. And these are all in the exhibition, by the way. And it would seem as though Amos, you know, had pretty much, um, you know, again, as she shifts to utilizing uh, textiles um, and she, you know, begins to emerge, um, you know, I mean, in, of, of course, uh, connect back with painting and expressionistic uh, tendencies. You, we can't forget that a lot of the innovation that she developed around printmaking uh, incorporated all of that, particularly this collage aesthetic uh, and uh, the use of the figure and how she begins to give these notions about weaving and sewing and how they kind of show up even in printmaking, which was, you know, such an important medium to her. And uh, Laurel talked a little bit about her connection to uh, the famed printmaker and printer uh, Kathy Caraccio uh, in the late 60s and 70s. And then um, eventually Caraccio would open up her own uh, studio um, after uh, working with Blackburn um, for a while as his apprentice initially. And all of these experiments began to kind of take on new form in different media, uh, you know, as Amos uh, worked with her uh, much more liberally and much more regularly. And Oh, next slide, please. And so we have all these experiments, again, that begin in the 70s. Uh, and this is the great um, color etching printed relief and silk screen uh, that's in the show that is at, owned by the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And again, this idea of kind of reconnecting and, and, and patching and kind of inventing uh, a new figure, uh, you know, using like variations in tone, um, variations in uh, print, uh, you know, inking and so forth. And I don't know if Laurel, if you wanted to talk a little bit about the next few slides, uh, yeah. like three ladies. What, well, I don't know if we want to scroll through or. Yeah, you know, we can just look at them all. I mean, actually, to go back, if we could go back to to Dream Girl, um, I think that's just an amazing example of. Um, Amos's printmaking and textile and figuration or coming together really in her figuration of the female figure. So in this, this is just such a cool um, print where she's actually given instructions, sort of the conceit is that the instructions are, are written as sewing, sewing directions. And so, um, you know, the, the owner of this print could actually follow these instructions in order to create a so-called dream girl. And that will involve cutting and manipulating this real print and following a kind of textile um, technique, weaving strips of paper, and eventually you will create this um, sort of seamed female figure. Um, so it really, um, textile print, Come, come together quite explicitly here. And it's all in the sort of service of, of creating this female figure, which I think, um, I don't know, says a lot about her practice. And we could, we could move to the next one. Um, yes, I think this is just a wonderful example of what we, yeah, what we might talk more in depth about her collage aesthetic. So she's, um, Amos is, making this at Blackburn's workshop, although it seems like she may have made it by herself, which is truly staggering. And this is a sort of, um, this print is taller than I am over um, almost, I think six feet. And you have these different bodies who are each one composed by multiple printmaking techniques and multiple tones all sort of adding up to these composite holes. And I, um, I just think it again, she's sort of harnessing the sort of um, printerly materials in order to convey the um, a sense of um, skin, of color, and a sort of um, a, yeah, a sense of color as not something that's monolithic or or singular, but is something that's relational. And, um, and particular. And I think you see that even in one individual body in this print. 
Um, and maybe we could move to the next ones, which come slightly later. We'll have a group of these stunning etching and aquatints from the 80s in the exhibition. And here you see, yeah, these, these poised female figures, some of whom look directly out their skin um, rendered by aquatint, which is a printmaking process that can um, create these rich passages of, of tone as you see um, in the skin and create these really am amazing patterns as you see in the, in the textiles, like the swimsuit and the rug that the um, bathers are sitting on in the bottom, uh, in the right-hand print. And one of the amazing things that she does, I think especially in the print at right, is she's actually cutting printmaking plates um, in order to create a, a kind of dynamism or um, movement in the figures. I'm not sure which print is next, but there might be a better example in the next. Yeah. So in this print, um, a, a remarkable technique she uses, which I have really rarely seen um, before. In this case, she actually composed this image of a female figure in a kind of melancholic pose like this um, on a singular rectangular printing plate, a copper plate. And then she actually cuts the print in half. So making a cut um, that basically traces the figure. And then she and her printer recombine the pieces of the plate um, in order to print them together. So they sort of form a jigsaw after they're cut apart and they print together. But the result is that you get this amazing fault line that develops between the two parts of the print that reads as this really amazing sort of jagged um, fault line. And at the very left-hand corner of the print, you can sort of see where it, where it starts um, on her, near where her elbow is. And I, I just think it's, it's an amazing effect. But what I think it also tells us is the way that Amos was sort of restless with the, the static quality of just the regular rectangular printing plate and finds ways as she does, as we've already seen in textile and painting to sort of cut things apart, manipulate them, reformulate them, reconstitute them in exactly the way she wants to do. So it sort of flies in the face of, I think usually what etchings do, which is create this you know singular image that is repeatable. And here she just she just uses it to her to her own ends and by literally cutting it in half. Yeah, I think um, I, th I think that again, this whole notion of inventiveness, not just in the process, but also in what <laughs> what what she can create with the figure or how she can transform it is really important. Like, I don't know if Callan, if we could advance to red line drawing. Yeah. And so, this, yeah, oh, go ahead. <laughs> you are an expert at this. I will let you oh, talk no, about this one. <laughs> great. I mean, so this is a drawing, a collage that she makes by ripping up the previous print that we just saw. So she uses fragments um, from that print and puts them into paper pulp and makes, an, again, another patchwork hole of female figures and pattern and tone and makes an entire, invents an entirely new work out of fragments of the old. Yeah, yeah, this is amazing. Yeah, it'll be amazing to have these um, together. Yeah, well, next, so we'll advance a little bit more. And these are just some other examples I'll just go through. This one is um, at the Museum of Modern Art. Oh, we'll keep going. And um, this great technique that um, I still have a hard time describing what the actual <laughs> medium is, we call it silk collagraph, which Amos ironically was worked with Caraccio and helped kind of perfect this method, right? Of yeah, they develop it together. And right, we could talk for an endless amount of time about about this technique and we don't really have to, but I mean, I think what this series, especially Creatures of the Night shows is the way that eventually Amos and Caraccio 
sort of basically invent a printmaking process that allows a true sort of gesture and movement in the printmaking practice. So you see her kind of wrestling with how to do that in etching. She breaks the plates, she's moving things around. She's trying to find movement in, in this medium. And this is basically what she and Kathy Caracci have developed this way of, cre of adding kind of gestural painting, painting gestural marks into a, a printmaking process, which is itself premised on textile. So it's it's this kind of amazing combo of um, all of the mediums that Amos calls her own. So I'm, a, I'm of course moving beyond my time limit <laughs> as I always do. And I just wanted to kind of advance uh, a little bit more so that we can uh, uh, see some more images and kind of prompt a little last minute wrap up before we uh, kind of take some questions um, from people. Uh, this is Crown. Uh, so I didn't get into talking a lot about um, Amos's connection to the feminist movement. In fact, that's one of the uh, one of the things that is kind of evolving. And I, and I say that my exhibition is the beginning of uh, study on Amos. Uh, rather than, uh, or beginning on a kind of a, re re a reclamation of study on Amos. I mean, people have studied Amos for, for several years. Um, but to begin to talk about her connections to more formal ties to uh, feminism and how that ties into uh, her notion of her own self-identity. Uh, she taught at Rutgers for many years. She knew a lot of great people uh, that were professors uh, that she worked with, uh, a lot of people on the New York um, art scene, like uh, individuals like Joyce Kozlov, um, you know, Vivian Brown, uh, Miriam Shapiro. Uh, she knew the late Camille Billups really well. Um, and a lot of these figures end up in her work, Faith Ringgold. Uh, you know, they end up in her work not only as people that she admired artistically, but also as kind of, uh, you know, women warriors who are in this, uh, on this art scene and, and who are kind of, you know, fighting these, uh, these forces of um, patriarchy that dominated the art world. And, um, and Callan is just kind of scrolling through a lot of different types of images. Um, and, we could stop here for a minute um, to just kind of talk about how not only does um, Amos engage with um, art world patriarchy, but she also deals with uh, this kind of cultural patrimony and uh, cultural symbols and so forth. And she often uses that to kind of battle against forces that often suppress people who are kind of on the margins like women or people of color. And so we have a lot of powerful uh, images that utilize the, the flag and at a time uh, that we're in in this country, um, you know, as we kind of question and grapple with our identity as Americans, uh, Amos also grappled with uh, notions about identity um, and she utilized, as we talked about earlier, um, photography uh, as a way of kind of creating her own form of documentation um, even as it might seem to be imaginative, but it also causes the question of, raises the question of whether all history is kind of relatively uh, imagined and invented and how we kind of see ourselves in it or are able to reframe ourselves in it. And so she, she kind of inherits as well as creates photography to kind of speak to a lot of um, you know, a lot of those, uh, those messages around her. And there's a lot of rich stuff we could probably talk about more. Um, and I'm sorry, Phoebe, that I'm talking too much. Because <laughs> this was, a, this is a great article in our, um, in, in our catalog, uh, where we talk, uh, where Phoebe Wolfskill talks a lot about uh, Amos's use of photography, and particularly in conjunction with the flag. Um, or with the U.S. flag, the Confederate flags, um, and, you know, how that kind of plays out. Yeah, yeah, so the, the two earlier images included photographs from the George uh, Chivery 
collection that she had inherited that I mentioned briefly earlier. Some of the photographs, I don't know where she got, the one in Seoul that was just there is an image of um, racial caricature, the little fisherman figurines in Seoul. Yeah, um, it took me a, a while to figure out exactly what they were. I knew they were um, stereotypes. I knew they were black stereotypes, but I had to really dig around to find them. Um, but here uh, in this particular example, she's taken the American flag. She's um, taken out the 50 stars, which of course are, are about colonialism in themselves. They're about claiming territory, you know, that they represent that space that's been taken up. Um, and then the idea of these black bodies being sold. So, you know, we, we think of slavery, but, but here, you know, what comes with slavery and after slavery to sort of keep black people in their place, um, as it were, uh, the idea of creating this kind of racial stereotype to say, okay, these are these sort of mindless beings. So there are these three guys um, up at the top of this flag sitting in a row waiting to be sold. And they actually have a price tag around their necks um, and they are fishermen characters without the pole. So, you know, the this is lawn or uh, lawn, ornament so you put it in your lawn and just you know sort of this idea of the little black boy fisherman um so she's taking a um a stereotype and it, you know when you see the work it's kind of hard to see what you're looking at at first but you realize there are some um sort of like partial columns that they're sitting on and some sort of Greek-like figures in the background as well, sort of white ceramic or something. Um, but in the foreground, then she's, she's painted on these figures. So we can't then see the American flag without the bodies that exist within this nation and the history of this nation um, and, the, and the kinds of images, uh, the kinds of symbols, another kind of symbol that this country has come up with, particularly to um, simplify the complexity of black people and black culture. And, um, and you know, this is part of what she deals with here. So, you know, at first you see a flag, you see a check mark, um, and then you sort of, you, you, you spend some time with these images and then you realize the sort of warring ideals that are going on there. Um, and that, you know, this racist past is sort of fundamental to um, who this country is, what this country is. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that, you know, it kind of uh, runs current in different ways um, in later work um, that, you know, kind of shapes kind of the arc of her career and, you know, Amos again, you know, plays with, you know, photography. She plays with cultural symbols, national symbols, uh, you know, even symbols that exist in the art world, you know, whether it be um, artists that we consider to be the, the heroes of, um, you know, the art history, global art history, uh, particularly those of European descent. And again, she inserts herself. And so there's this power in self-portraiture uh, that uh, comes up uh, with Amos um, throughout her career, but particularly when she inserts herself into these, um, into these later works that uh, are formed in the 1990s, uh, where she kind of juxtaposes herself with uh, art historical figures, um, historical figures, and makes kind of commentary about uh, sexism, um, you know, other uh, isms, if you will, uh, that exist. And uh, Diane, I know that, you know, much of your work revolves around um, portraiture. And I'm, I'm wondering what you're thinking when you see works like this, and if we advance a few slides uh, to- This work works. in particular is a revelation. It's, it, this one also, the whole idea of that, if you're not a white male artist, you're not an artist. So if you're an African-American artist, then you're an African-American artist. That was always an issue. My portraiture, I paint all races. I mostly paint family and friends and they have to be akin to me, someone I'm really close to. But this particular painting, Tightrope, it's a revelation. And she is standing on that border between what's happening in traditional white male imagery and what she can do to rescue it, but also hold on to it so we can all see it. Yeah, and I think there's this tension between Amos admiring many of these artists. I mean, she loved mm -hmm. Matisse, she loved Gauguin's work, mm -hmm. she loved Picasso's work, but at the same time, being feeling that if I love your work, I can also critique your work. Yes. And there's a, a, a lot of uh, 
writing or interviews that I've read about um, on Amos. And even, you know, when while she was alive, she talked about wanting there to be more critique of her work, wanting people to talk about her work and how important that is for artists to have this kind of dialogue with their public, but also dialogue amongst themselves about, you know, perce perceptions of greatness and what's really great or what really isn't great and how, you know, every artist is kind of evolving over time and that they're, you know, it's the individuals will create these, these standards or canons, uh, you know, and whole groups of people will kind of validate certain artists. Uh, and, you know, I think that a lot of her work kind of uh, debates, you know, how those canons are formed. Um, and if uh, we could advance, and I know I'm way over time. <laughs> So just look at a few more things, work suit, uh, where she's kind of critiquing uh, the painter Lucian Freud after seeing his exhibition. And she places herself as Lucian Freud. She kind of snatches his body, becomes a male body, but she still has the same head. Uh, but she fancies using her own tools and her own uh, imagery uh, to, to kind of confront this stereotype uh, of her as a woman artist not being able to perform on the level of a, uh, a male artist, but also a white male artist. I and often tell my students that critique is a gift. You can't buy one. To have one is very personal and very important to their creativity. Yeah, yeah. And being able to kind of eval also evaluate how critique has occurred over time and how it kind of can you know, be nuanced over time, that's also important. And this is models, um, you know, from 1995, where she's kind of looking at the kind of Greek, uh, the Greek ideal, and then she's also comparing it uh, to, you know, later figures of uh, Matisse. Um, then she asserts herself, and then she also X's out herself. These X's kind of show up a lot where she's both canceling herself out, but also suggesting kind of an unknown or an uncertainty that we have to uh, raise when we look at all these uh, all these images from the past. So kind of in thinking, and I'll let uh, Callan kind of scroll and we'll kind of wrap up, um, you know, some thoughts. I, I, I'm, I'm wondering what, uh, what you all think the uh, Amos's legacy uh, would be um, in a time like this. I mean, you know, I've, I've had people ask me, well, what I thought Amos's legacy was, uh, particularly during a pandemic uh, and that in all types of national unrest. And um, I often like to think that um, the legacy that Amos presents is one of as she, as she kind of has this type of uh, fascination with the past and this fascination with, uh, with figures and with leaders. I mean, we, we've all been, you know, dealing uh, intellectually with the whole idea of what constitutes uh, true, you know, true Americanness, what constitutes uh, patriotism, uh, leadership, um, all of these things have been, you know, thoughts that have been going through our minds uh, in, you know, in recent days. And I think that she offers uh, this idea that critique and questioning as well as kind of an inventive, inventiveness and uh, innovation are all a part of uh, the artist toolbox. Um, that creativity involves being able to, to think critically about uh, yourself, uh, in your work, uh, whether whether you insert yourself visually in your work or not, you you are part of your work, but also that it's a work in progress and it's composed of many pieces that are not always going to be viewed as conventional, or always not not always going to be viewed as uh, historically uh, accepted, but they're still a part of it, and you can make it your own. Um, you can make uh, the work your own and and kind of have this kind of unique uh, presence um, in the art world uh, that should be recognized. I think she was a storyteller. Yeah. And she had truths to share with the world. 
And this, we shouldn't understate the fact that she was an educator. She yeah. taught at Mason Grove School. She retired there as a full professor. She was a part of the Skowhegan and she taught there and was on the board. So she was always about supporting younger artists. Right, and education. Yes. Yeah, I think, I mean, she'll go down as a, a master appropriator, um, certainly a, a Black feminist artist, but she's so complicated. And I think that's part of the reason she's sort of hard to fit in any category because she's doing so many things and they can't easily be summed up in terms of race, in terms of gender, in terms of um, appropriation, in terms of looking to old masters and all of those things. And she's, as you all have shown, she's using so many different techniques and fabrics. So I think she is so very complicated. It's very hard to sum her up. And that I, I do think, um, you know, when I teach surveys of African-American art and so forth, um, you know, the you know, you're, you're looking for some kind of narrative. And I think she's, she's really hard to do that with. Um, and, you know, with, with the article that I published previously on her, I basically spent the whole time on two compositions. That's how, that's how complicated she is. So, so, I, you know, I want her to go down as, as like Diane was saying, an educator. She was, she was teaching for 28 years. Imagine all the people she influenced. Um, uh, Latoya Ruby Frazier, um, mentioned how generous she was, just like Diane did, um, and I think I, I think her body of work is just you know this is the sort of starting point for discovery. I think there's so much more to, that we can do with it. Well, great. I really I really appreciate this conversation. I think this is great. I mean, it's as as you can already see, we could go on for about five hours <laughs> talking. Uh, there's so many more great things uh, to discuss, uh, great images, great works uh, that are both at the museum, but also just out in the world uh, by Amos. And uh, I think that, you know, as we kind of move into the future, I think a greater appreciation will take place. And there's always something more to see in her work. I mean, I was walking through the galleries um, today uh, just to, you know, before the talk and, you know, every painting I passed, I saw something new. And, you know, I was like, okay, I don't have time to put a little inset detail of this little aspect of a painting that I've never discovered before. But I mean, you could do that, that you could do that in innumerable ways um, with her work. And so I think it's a lot of rich study that can begin, um, you know, with kind of a reconsideration of a lot of the works that uh, were in her, um, were in her repertoire. So I think we have uh, a little time for to answer a couple of questions. I don't know if Callan uh, wanted to kind of point out any, I don't know if I've, we've covered some of it in some of our discussion. Um, there are just a couple questions from um, the audience and I just want to thank everybody for attending today. Um, I know we went a little past time, but it was, it was such a rich, interesting conversation. So um, I appreciate all our um, um, all the panelists and, and participants today. So just a couple of quick questions. Um, let's see, there's one from um, a couple from Jennifer Mack asking about whether Kathy and Robert collaborated or if she created prints on her own as well. And then... Uh Oh, um, I'll, I'll just uh, answer that based on a kind of anecdotally. Um, I talked to um, to Kathy Caraccio, I think it was about uh, a little bit over a year ago. And I asked her, you know, like, what was the environment like for um, working with, you know, Bob Blackburn, um, for example, in Blackburn Studio. And she said it was pretty a pretty loose environment where Blackburn was... Uh, pretty open to artists kind of coming in and doing their thing. I mean, I don't think that Amos necessarily worked with Blackburn or it's it's unclear, I'll, let me put it that way, um, closely in the sense that you can necessarily see his hand uh, in her work. I think that she pretty much was utilized uh, the workshop and did a lot of things, you know, relatively independently in many cases, um, as well as probably with other artists, uh, Kathy Caraccio being a, a person that she, again, 
would have gotten to know, but I didn't get the sense, uh, even from Amos herself, that she always worked closely with um, Bob Blackburn, but she did work with, um, in the workshop with his, um, you know, with probably a variety of individuals, but also pretty independently uh, on some projects. Yeah, and a number of the prints she made were, yeah, additioned by Blackburn. She's working with various printers, but yeah, develops this close relationship with Kathy. And Kathy is trained, I think she trained for four years in the Blackburn workshop and then kind of uses that model in some ways to start her own. So, um, and yeah, Amos continues to print with her there. And then as sort of a follow-up to that question, um, Jennifer also asked, was Kathy able to help Emma promote her work during the 60s when African-American artists couldn't show their work everywhere? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, maybe yeah. not so much during the 60s, but maybe I guess in the 80s um, in terms of maybe joint you know, like uh, group exhibitions, uh, maybe by people who were actively printing uh, mm -hmm. And that would continue, uh, you know, into the future, you know, uh, Caraccio in particular was quite prolific, had several artists kind of come through mm -hmm. um, her studio. So, uh, in fact, she's got a great, um, you know, obviously collection of right. artists that work with her. So, you know, in that sense, you know, probably form, form people formulated group exhibitions that, that, of which Amos was a part of and yeah. Um, and others so. Yeah, I think she really assisted Amos with realizing what she wanted to do in print. It really was as a kind of working and creative relationship. Um, although I remember Kathy has a funny anecdote. I mean, very technically speaking, the silk aquatint process that they invent, that's a kind of a sort of more poetic name for that technique, silk aquatint, than polyester collagraph, which would be the um, more apt technical term. And that's so sort of together, Kathy and Amos decided to sort of come up with this more marketable term. So in some ways, you know, maybe that had an effect on her marketability and that kind of thing. Thank you. Um, and then Janice Simon asks, um, did Amos hang out with any of the abstract expressionists during her early years in New York? Um, she was struck by their relationship with second generation um, ABEX artists. Um, one thing I would say about that is, you know, within Spiral, there are a lot of ABEXers in there. Um, Hale Woodruff, actually one of the works in the exhibition reminds me of a Hale Woodruff ABEX piece. Um, there's sort of the color palette that doesn't seem very Amos, it's more dull in the 50s work. And um, the sort of figuration sort of coming out seems similar to Hale Woodruff's work. Um, Spiral also has Norman Lewis, who's a profound abstractionist and Charles Alston. There's a couple of those guys in that group that would have been very much engaged with abstract expressionism. Um, and then, you know, maybe changing their minds by the 60s, but, but would have that behind them for sure. And we'll have, let's see, um, another person is asking if you could speak to the choice of the exhibition title, Color Odyssey. <laughs> well, I, you know, it was one of the things that, uh, you know, I go back and forth about it because when I first uh, started looking at Amos and thinking about the exhibition, of course, like a lot of people, I um, immediately thought about color. You know, but I thought about it in a kind of, you know, in, you know, the chromatic uh, brilliance of the work. But as it evolved, uh, I began to see that it took on a whole nother meaning. Um, as Amos famously quoted, every time I use color, it's a political act. And so that kind of tied into other things that were emerging uh, in her work. So not just the kind of chromatic brilliance of some early paintings and some of the uh, works that incorporate fabric uh, and textiles, but also just this notion of how it informs how she thinks about narrative in, um, in many of her compositions, this whole notion of how we interpret color as people uh, and how we look at things through the lens of uh, you know, what the 
uh, with the color, if you will. So this kind of odyssey, you know, I'm kind of suggesting that, you know, she's on this constant never ending search to determine, you know, the limits of, um, you know, of color, uh, as well as its uh, intentions. And so I think that she does it in a variety of ways. You know, we've seen the various media that she employs. So that, you know, although I went back and forth about changing the title, I was like, oh, I think I'm going to keep it. I think it's still a color odyssey for, for Amos. I would say I, I like it because it is it's like a, a trek, an experience, and that she, you know, she has a ten-part series from 1988, I believe, called Odyssey that goes back to the South, that goes back to Atlanta, and thinks about her own heritage. So, yeah, I, I, I like the title very much. All right, thank you. I think there um, there was one more question we didn't get to yet, and I know we're right. We're we're an hour and a half in, so maybe this could be our, our this will be our last one. Um, this um, participant is saying, um, having done etching in college, would you agree that this medium is an interesting combination of fine motor skill and not insignificant strength when it comes to working with the plates? She's wondering about her physique, her etching, textile work, and the mosaic bench bring to mind a strong physical woman who enjoyed melding strength with the beauty of her artistic expression. Can any of you speak to this impression? Um, perhaps having a printer minimize the, the strength aspect. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, yeah, I agree. At least I'll just speak about the etching. It can be intensely physical um, and Kathy Caraccio gave me the impression that it was likely Amos's husband who helped cut the prints. I mean, to cut through a thick copper etching plate is no small action. So um, I honestly, it mystifies me exactly how, how she did this um, in this print and the previous ones, um, especially where they follow the contours of a female figure, really staggering and um, physically extremely dexterous and, um, I, it's it's a it's a marvel, I think. Thank you. That was the final question, Shania. So if there's that's all we've got from the audience. Okay. Well, again, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for having this conversation with me, and I'd also like to thank our audience uh, for participating today. Remember that the exhibition is on view and it will close in April. So there's plenty of time uh, to come and see the exhibition. It's great. Uh, and it will be, there will be other opportunities to see it, but we want you to see it in Georgia first uh, and then see it again uh, at our other venues uh, that we have planned for 2021. Thanks, thanks, Shania. Well, thank you all. <laughs> And we'll be in touch again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.